On primetime politics tonight, Ontario, one of the hotbeds of COVID surge in Canada, releases its latest ominous modeling numbers as the Omicron variant takes over. And Quebec introduces new restrictions as infections spike again there. This expert on what's needed to blunt the effects of Omicron. The Minister of Public Safety tells a Commons Committee action to ban handguns in Canada is coming soon. We'll uh, speak with MPs and debate the government's approach to gun and gang violence. And our panel of political commentators on the Omicron response, the first four weeks of the new parliament, and more. We'll begin with the latest on the response to the rise in COVID cases in Canada and the concerns about the Omicron variant. Central Canada, it's been the centre of the surge in new COVID cases fueled by Omicron. Today, the province of Quebec reported 2,736 new infections and the Premier there announcing new restrictions in the province. Ontario reported 2,421 new infections today and declared that Omicron is now the dominant variant in the province. Ontario released new modelling numbers that warn without cutting back on social contacts by at least 50 percent and ramping up booster shots to 250,000 per day. Daily case counts could be as high as 10,000 by the end of this month. That would leave hospital intensive care units overwhelmed. This will likely be the hardest wave of the pandemic. But if we can control it and drive vaccination as hard as we can, we can make it to the exit. And there is an exit plan from the pandemic. We just need to push as hard as we can and control its immediate impact as much as we can tolerate. Dr. Isaac Bogosh is an infectious disease specialist at the Toronto General Hospital. Uh, Dr. Bogosh, good to see you again. Thanks for taking time to speak with me. Uh, what stands out for you uh, in these new modeling numbers released today in Ontario? A couple of key points. One is that we're really sitting on the cusp of what's probably going to be a pretty large Omicron wave and that uh, we, you know, predictable bottleneck our ICU capacity. It's a predictable bottleneck. It's been a bottleneck uh, in Ontario, for example, uh, during the second and third waves. It's been a bottleneck in Alberta, Saskatchewan, currently in Manitoba, BC shuffling patients around. Like, this is really a Canada-wide issue. We don't have a ton of ICU capacity. Some of it's related to beds. A lot of it's really driven by personnel, and we've seen some, um, you know, significant attrition from healthcare. Who can blame? It's been a tough 18 months. Right. Uh, but yeah, this is going to be something that we're going to be contending with, unfortunately. So, you know, Dr. Brown at the science table in Ontario says uh, we need some significant circuit breakers here to reduce contacts. Uh, are, are we headed for a return to lockdowns? I sure hope not. I really, really hope not. I think if people continue to, we actually have this tools to, pro, to blunt this wave. We're not going to stop this wave, but we can certainly blunt this wave, right? If we keep our gatherings small, if we wear masks on when, when we're indoor settings and use high quality masks, if we get vaccinated with dose one, dose two, dose three, whenever we're uh, we're eligible, if we have better ventilated indoor spaces, like we can we now we'll see more and more rapid tests being mobilized throughout the country. Uh, I think like these are the tools that we can really help protect ourselves, our families, our communities, hmm. and we can blunt this wave with them. We're not going to stop it, but we can we can actually lessen the sting. Yeah, that's that's an important point. Uh, you know, Ontario has the, cut the capacity limits to 50 percent for large venues that hold more than a thousand people. Um, is that the kind of circuit breaker that's going to curb the spread in a meaningful way, or do we need something more? Well, I think there's currently the policy that we have will help a little bit, but it's not going to, you know, stop what's coming our way. I think there currently would be up to individuals to choose to have smaller gatherings. And I got to be totally honest here. It's not really like uh, lots of people are watching, you know, TV at 11 o'clock in the morning with press releases talking about this. Like we actually need to enroll behavioral change experts marketing firms, ad agencies, specialists in behavioral change to get the message out in an age appropriate, language appropriate, culturally appropriate manner to really drive the behavior that we think is appropriate over the holidays, which is no one's canceling mm. Christmas. Have a wonderful time, but keep your contacts much smaller than you know what might have been planned initially. Given how fast uh, Omicron spreads, uh, how effective will any uh, measure short of a lockdown uh, be on stopping the spread? I think that's, you know, I think there's this feeling that people have in their gut that, oh no, here we, you know, this looks a lot like the first three or four months of, uh, of COVID-19. And uh, should they feel that way? Absolutely not. 
I'm not diminishing how significant this wave might be, right? This, this could be pretty rough, and we could be in for a, quite a turbulent December and January. Having said that, I mean, when we were starting with COVID-19 at the very beginning, you know, in March of 2020 in Canada, we didn't have many of the tools that we have right now. Like, we're in the vaccine era. Vaccines will help. They're not perfect, but they'll help. Three doses is better than two. This will Three doses can prevent COVID-19. It's not going to be perfect. It'll keep you out of hospital by and large. Same with two doses might help. Not as good as three, but it will help. And it can certainly decrease the severity of infection. Rapid test. We have free, soon to be widely available rapid tests, depending on where you are in the country. We're going to see those with increasing frequency. We can put them to good use. Masks. Like masks are everywhere. There's no reason to not have a high quality mask. Um, you know, yeah. we know about ventilated indoor settings. Like we have the tools to blunt this. It's Let's interesting. Use all you, at our disposal. you talk about rapid tests and, and, and you and I've talked, well, we've been talking for almost two years fairly regularly about this, but we've talked a lot about uh, the need for rapid tests. Uh, we're hearing a lot about them now and provinces are rolling them out more and more. And, but it, it you know, it makes me think that had we been more, uh, proactive with rapid tests in the in the months preceding this, uh, there'd be a culture of rapid testing. And I'm not sure we have that in our country right now, maybe when we need it most. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, we've been banging this drum for a long time. Hey, better late than never. Uh, and, you know, we could all take a page out of the Nova Scotia playbook. Uh, they've been using these and integrating these into the community settings for quite a while. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. They've been doing it. We can just copy and paste exactly what they've been doing. Make them available. Show people how to use them. Here's what you do with the positive test. Here's what you do with the negative test. And make them and lower every possible barrier to rapid test. Again, yeah. it's not a silver bullet. Not going to stop the pandemic. It's an important piece of a much larger puzzle, but it's a very helpful piece. All right. As always, uh, Dr. Isaac Bogosh, thanks so much for your time. Great to talk to you again. Have a great day. Canada's Minister of Public Safety says the federal government will be pushing ahead early in the new year to create a $1 billion fund to ban handguns. Marco Mendicino appeared before the Commons Public Safety Committee today. It is examining gun control measures to curb gun crimes and illegal trafficking after a surge in gun violence this fall, especially in the city of Montreal, where there have been more than 100 shootings this year and three teenagers have been killed. The new federal funds would go to provinces to ban handguns, but municipalities might also be given the federal funds. Some provinces, though, have taken steps to block cities from implementing handgun bans unilaterally. It is a fact that the majority of gun-related homicides involve a handgun. And that's why our government is committed to investing $1 billion to support those provinces and territories who want to ban handguns. We are going to increase criminal penalties for gun smuggling and trafficking and to enhance the capacity of police and border officials to keep illegal firearms and ammunition out of the country. Well, let's follow up on the federal push to ban handguns. Let's bring in three members of parliament to discuss the government's approach. Uh, Pam DeBoff is the parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Public Safety. Raquel Dancho is the public safety critic for the official opposition, Conservatives. And Peter Julian is the house leader for the NDP. Good to see you all. Uh, thanks for your time today. Uh, Pam DeBoff, let me, let me start with you. Statistics Canada reports that from 2009 to 2019, criminal use of firearms uh, increased 81% in this country. Uh, we've seen the spike in gun violence in many Canadian Canadian cities, uh, many of the crimes committed with illegal guns often smuggled into Canada. Uh, most of the measures so far have failed to address this growing problem. So how will a ban on handguns make a difference? Well, I, a, a ban on handguns is only one aspect. I think it's really important to take a multi-pronged approach to the issue of, of gun violence in our cities. And and so that's why we've reinvested in CBSA, Canadian Border Services Agency, the RCMP. That's why we're investing in a uh, crime reduction strategy to, to reduce the number of young people that go into to gangs. Uh, so there's, there's a multi-pronged approach that's needed here. Mm. It's not one one solution for the problem. And, you know, it's it's important that we keep that in mind as we, we look at these issues, that there's not one solution to okay. go uh, forward. How, with. how um, let me ask you, um, how uniform would this ban when when uh, when the, it's finally announced, and we expect that in the new year, the, the billion dollar fund, how uniform would this ban across Canada be? Some provinces have already said they have no interest in implementing a handgun ban. Are we headed for some sort of a patchwork of policies across the country? 
Well, I think we need to listen to people and wait until the the announcement is made. I'm not going to I'm not going to comment on a policy that hasn't been brought forward yet. All right, uh, Raquel Dancho, uh, what's your party's position on a federal uh, fund of a billion dollars to ban handguns? I think it'd be completely ineffective, and that billion dollars would be much better. Uh, much better well spent uh, combating gang activity and smuggling of illegal firearms at the border. We know that this is where these are areas where the majority of gun crime comes from. It is from uh, gang violence uh, as a result of drug trafficking. And most of the guns uh, used to commit gun crime in Canada are illegally smuggled across the border. So we find this measure to be very expensive. We know that the RCMP and urban police forces and the Ontario police are already taxed to the max and we're seeing rising violence across the country. Uh, five of the last six years, we've seen increases in violent crime. So we know our police forces are already maxed out. They could use extra resources as it is. So to reroute all the already stretched resources to uh, a ban of this kind, which won't be effective anyway, uh, seems a, a terrible use of taxpayer resources and a terrible use of RCMP time that should be used to go after the criminals, gang right. members and smuggling. Uh, Peter Julian, let me turn to you. Do, uh, where's the NDP uh, on, the, on a ban on handguns and how the government's going about that by offering money to the provinces that want to ban them? Uh, well, we know that there are provinces and, and, and cities that are are interested in moving in this direction because they're concerned about uh, high levels of gun violence. I would agree it takes a multifaceted approach. I, I, I just am re reminded of the Harper government eliminating the crime prevention centers across the country. And so the, I don't think the Conservatives can give uh, give lessons to anyone, given that, that poorly thought out decision that unfortunately the Trudeau government has continued. Crime prevention centers were a great investment, reduced crime rates, and a dollar spent on crime prevention saved six dollars in policing and and uh, court and and prison costs. And so, what we we need to do is make the investments uh, around the the gun smuggling that is taking place across the border. Uh, neither the Harper government nor the Trudeau government have really cracked down on gun smuggling, illegal guns coming across the border. Right. So I think both parties have had the wrong approach. Uh, our approach is much more multifaceted and, and makes the investments that will keep okay, Canadians let, safe. Let me talk about that. Pam Damoff, uh, banning handguns uh, is one thing, but how do you stop the illegal guns from getting into this country? We heard a lot about that at the committee today. Uh, is enough being done at the border uh, to block the smuggling of illegal guns through border communities, including uh, some of those Indigenous communities along the border? Well, I, that, that's a really good question. And actually, the commissioner, uh, Brenda Lucky from the RCMP, in response to a conservative question today, said that in the guns that they trace, 73% of the guns used in crime are actually domestically sourced, and only 27% are smuggled. We've reinvested in the border and in the RCMP. So the conservatives had cut, um, the conservatives had cut, um, a thousand jobs from CBSA and and nineteen hundred from the RCMP under their debt reduction action plan. So we've been reinvesting in both of those agencies so that they can do the good work that they're c capable of doing. So I find it a bit rich for the Conservatives now to be saying that we should be putting money into these things. But when they were in office, this is where they made the cuts. We need right. to be focused both domestically and. Uh, at the border. And today, at, on Bill C-71, sending regulations back to the House of Commons to have them come into force to actually make a difference on domestic firearms that be, are being diverted to criminals, the Conservatives voted no on that. All right. Raquel Dancho, uh, what are your views on the gun smuggling problem at the border? And, and uh, Pam Damoff's point that the RCMP commissioner says, look, uh, most of this stuff's coming, is being sourced domestically. We know the Toronto police are saying that 80% of the gun violence they're experiencing in that city are from illegally smuggled guns. So it's important that we take in the Toronto context, which is seeing the highest rates of gun violence. It's also important to remember that the Liberal government has been in power for six years, and five out of those six years we've seen increased violent crime. Gun crime has gone up every year. In fact, homicides are at a 30-year they have not been this high in 30 years. So as long as I've been alive, there have not been this many homicides. And a third of homicides are committed with guns. So we know that there are significant measures that need to be taken and further investments need to be made at our border. And again, a lot of these investments have come in sort of at the tail end of this government in the last year or two. And they've had six years to uh, add more resources to the border. I asked the CBSA and the RCMP today. Uh, rather than having that billion dollars go to a useless buyback program or a provincial ban, what would you do with a billion dollars? And they would hire more police resources. They would hire more border agents. They would be able to better target the problem 
if the liberal government would target the money where the problem really is, right. and that's on gun smuggling and gang violence. Uh, Peter Julian, what's, what's a different approach on, on how to deal with the smuggling at the border? Uh, well, ma making sure we're, we're making the investments to start. This is a major problem, and uh, numbers differ as to, to what extent we're getting illegal weapons involved in gun crime, but it's high. I can tell you from my communities that I represent uh, that it has it's a serious problem uh, that neither the former Harper government nor the, the Trudeau government have actually taken seriously. We need to take this issue seriously. Uh, the number of gun deaths, the number of, uh, of gun crimes is increasing. And so we need to make sure that we're making every attempt to keep Canadians safe. Uh, that does not mean uh, photo ops, and it certainly doesn't mean investing just in one area when there are a number of areas where investments are required. And, and so uh, we, we believe in a more comprehensive approach. Okay. Uh, quickly finish on, on this part. Uh, Bill C-5, uh, introduced uh, by your government, Pam DeMoff, and includes... Uh, eliminating mandatory minimums on offenses uh, for possessing a restricted firearm with ammunition, weapons trafficking, discharging a firearm while committing an offense, extortion and robbery with a firearm. Um, explain to me how eliminating mandatory minimums from offenses that may involve those kinds of offenses uh, uh, deals with the problem of gun violence. So there's no evidence that mandatory minimum penalties deter uh, criminals. But there is evidence that it puts Indigenous peoples and Black Canadians into our prison system. And what's important to recognize is that we're not getting rid of penalties for these crimes. We're getting rid of the minimum penalty. We are trusting in our judicial system, which is in, in our judges who are independent, to make those decisions. So we're not getting rid of the penalties. It's only the minimum penalty that's, that's um, being removed. Right. And there is evidence that it's disproportionately impacting the most vulnerable and our communities and sending them to prison. Raquel Dancho, what's your response to that? I think it's important to remember that after the last six years of the Liberals in government, we've seen uh, major increases in drug trafficking across the border. Drug trafficking is deeply interrelated with gang violence and gun crime. And yet that issue has not been resolved and there are not nearly enough resources to attack that uh, through the RCMP and the CBSA. Unfortunately, in Bill C-5, which was introduced in the House of Commons shortly after one of the shootings in Montreal, uh, that will re remove mandatory prison time for those who are drug traffickers. And remember, opioids are killing 7,000 Canadians a year. So Bill C-5 means that those responsible for killing 7,000 Canadians a year with opioids, those drug pushers and traffickers and manufacturers, yeah. will not have mandatory prison time, nor will those who use firearms for robbery, extortion, a whole host of other extremely dangerous gun crimes. There is no longer, after Bill C-5, there will no longer be mandatory prison sentences okay, for those criminals. Mr. Julian, where's the mandatory where's minimums? The NDP, where's the, where, mandatory min Mr. Julian, where's the, uh, the NDP on C-5? Well, we, we, we believe that uh, the mandatory minimums that the Harper government brought in at the same time as they slashed major funding for crime prevention centers across the country, which has led, uh, started to provoke that higher crime rate. It's simply a wrong-headed approach, and the reality is uh, many of uh, the mandatory minimums have fallen upon Indigenous people uh, and and uh, and people of colour. Uh, the, the reality, the evidence is there that uh, our judicial system works effectively when uh, they are presented with the evidence. And, and okay. so uh, this idea that you can simply have a spin as the Harper government did, uh, making wrong-headed decisions, including uh, putting in place uh, mandatory minimums, is, is not the right approach. We believe in a much more right. comprehensive approach to keep right. people safe, and uh, we're going to continue to press the, that case in Parliament. All right, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you all for your time today, and uh, the committee continues its uh, study, the Public Safety Committee, but uh, thanks for your time today to all of you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Let's bring in our panel of political commentators now. Greg McEachern is a liberal commentator, Tim Powers a conservative commentator, and Kim Wright is an NDP commentator. Great to see you all this week. I uh, hope everybody's doing well as uh, we are in the era of Omicron here and things are changing quickly. Uh, Greg, Canadians still digesting the latest COVID blow uh, from the fast spread of Omicron, the variant, and new measures to try to flatten that surge. Still lots of discussion today about the federal advisory against non-essential foreign travel. Uh, some reports that, you know, premiers pushed back, uh, pushed back against the travel rules, the travel industry is upset. Uh, I guess I'm wondering how confident we should be that our political leaders have learned from the response over the past two years and have the right approach to another bad wave of COVID. 
I think that the, the challenge is, um, you, know, you know, it's our federation. I've, I've watched, I, you know, I hate to minimize this because we are very concerned, obviously, about our health right now. But you see from different politicians, um, different premiers, folks in the media, the, the understanding of where healthcare care is a responsibility lies. So I, I think that's a, a big challenge. So you can see things like what happens in Nova Scotia versus what happens in Alberta. I was in Nova Scotia recently. First time I was on a plane in about two years, I landed. They handed me two rapid tests. Mm. They asked me to do one right away, one three days later. And I can tell you, having that peace of mind was a great thing. There was also a testing center right downtown. Uh, I was told to go. They handed me a box of five rapid tests. I, I brought them back to Ottawa with me. And, and you know, uh, my colleagues on the, on the panel, you know, in our own jobs, we were probably doing the same thing, mm. trying to secure tests for our colleagues and employees. Uh, and then you look at Alberta, and I watched the, the press conference with Premier Kenny this week, and, you know, th this is a person that really wanted to have the Calgary Stampede. And, and I think Canadians would rather have Christmas than, than the Calgary Stampede. So I think there's a big challenge because you can look at so many jurisdictions and say, and see different yeah, things. this is not... This is not going smoothly here in Ontario. You know, it, it, it does feel like we are behind and trying to catch up. All right. I'm trying to get a booster shot. I'm five weeks out. And, and once again, you feel like you're in the Hunger Games. All right, uh, Tim, lots of questions around the effect of the, uh, the, the federal travel advisory and a lot of people having to make these choices now about what to do and how to respond to it. Uh, interesting, I think, that conservatives have decided their members can go ahead and travel if they want, ignoring that travel advisory. Liberals and Democrats have been told to stay home. Uh, what do you think of the position that the conservatives have taken on this issue? Well, the travel advisory is a bit like motherly guilt. It's you shouldn't really do it, but you can. Uh, and I hope that I think the liberals uh, are of the view that it will have that impact. I know of three people, uh, three different people who are going to travel anyway, because the, for them, the trips with their families is an important uh, mental health escape. And that's an oft under talked about issue in all of this. Other conservatives. Um, I guess they're saying we're going to follow the, the federal rules. Uh, we're not saying you don't have to travel. If you want to, you can. Um, it's hard to be too critical of that because, again, I think the everyday person is likely to do the same thing, Peter. And I do think there's another narrative that politicians are conscious of, and it's one that involves not giving the anti-vax crowd any uh, any weapons uh, or weaponizing further the anti-vax crowd because those of us who perceive boosters uh, are continuously told we will be safe and we will be okay right. and that the boosters will work and they're the best line of defense. So if all of a sudden you step further uh, back to 2020 and into many of those measures that were there, that becomes a problem of legitimacy. Okay. Uh, Kim Wright, the head of Ontario's science table, said today, look, we're in for the worst wave of COVID uh, yet with uh, Omicron. Uh, how confident should Canadians be in how our political leaders are handling the response? Well, I think there's two parts to this. One, how our political leaders are handling this. Some places like Nova Scotia have handled this much better than others. They've had contact tracing. They've had rapid testing in their liquor stores and in their libraries for the last few weeks. They've been giving them out, uh, you know, like proverbial candy, which I think is actually useful. We've been doing that in our own business and certainly with our clients. Other places like Ontario have been caught a bit flat-footed, it seems, that they, you know, weren't sure how to roll these things out. I'm glad to see that the Ford government is finally starting to. I'd also like to see over the Christmas holidays uh, to open up booster shots in schools, use those local schools in our right. communities, making it free and accessible. There's lots of things that can be done better. I think one of the things that I, I would caution politicians, in particular in the Conservative uh, Party, uh, not to get too comfortable with uh, going out and traveling, because I think the tale of uh, Rod Phillips in Ontario going off to St. Bart's uh, and getting fired Fired for it should be a cautionary tale for people. Right, right. I, Although I he did, he did that, that again. He did that against the orders of the premier, though. Uh, well, people were told not a, to travel. That is, a, that is a question mark as to whether or not he did that against the wishes okay. or understanding the, of the premier. I mean, on the testing, thing, just to make a point, Isaac Bogosh is uh, on the program earlier saying, you know, like we, we are behind the, the curve on this. We're, we're now trying to develop a culture of. Of, of rapid testing that we probably should have had developed by now so that everybody in the country, this would be standard practice yep. uh, everywhere you go. Okay, Greg, I want to pivot here. Um, every day the, the uh, opposition hammers the government over inflation and affordability issues.
Texas. And I'm wondering if you, as you watch that, uh, those narratives, uh, how vulnerable you think the government is on that? And what do you think of the fact that it's, it's it clearly, uh, other than Omicron, it's the issue of the day every day in the House of Commons? Yeah, it, it is the issue of the day. And, and I, I know in you know my own family and my own friends, uh, inflation definitely is a big issue. And, you know, the people I talk to in government, they're, they're well aware of that. I think uh, I, I would look back a couple of weeks ago that had uh, inflation as the number one issue, surpassing health. And I remember thinking at the time, I wonder if that will hold. And right now, I'm not sure if people were to be asked maybe this weekend right. if they agree with that. But in the same poll, uh, polling period, Justin Trudeau rose, Aaron O'Toole fell. So in terms of getting making political hay for their benefit, so far it doesn't seem to have worked for the Conservatives. The other challenge for the Conservatives on this is when uh, their Conservative critic, Pierre Polliver, gets a little loose with the facts. And I've seen him be corrected in the House by, obviously, uh, Minister Freeland, but also by reporters, by people in press conferences. And I think we're a little bit hyper-aware of the U U.S. situation where little lies turned into a big lie. So I think yeah. the Conservatives have to be really careful there that when they're skating on this, they're skating on facts and not uh, embellishment. How, how do you see this narrative unfolding, uh, Tim? And uh, do you think, uh, who's got an advantage here if there is one? Well, certainly Canadians don't have an advantage because we're all paying more, Peter. Um, I, I think the Conservatives aren't as uh, concerned about facts. Maybe they should be. Uh, Pierre Polyev, I don't think, would ever transform himself into the Minister of Finance, but he's certainly the chief agitator right now. And he's, his agitation, I think, is garnering headlines that Conservatives are generally happy with. Um, I, people are worried about this. Uh, it may, as Greg says, be overtaken over the next number of weeks by, uh, by Omicron, but uh, it's going to continue. Uh, and people are looking for remedies. It is not. It's, it'd be foolish to sit here and say it's the fault uh, of the Trudeau government. Everybody has some part to contribute mm. to the inflationary challenge, uh, but it's a pain that they're part of overseeing at a time when Canadians are going through one hell uh, of a period of history. Right. Uh, we, we're hanging this conversation, Kim, to finish up here on inflation, but the, the broader issue is, is affordability, and that keeps coming up in the House of, House of Commons as well. Uh, New Democrats have, have raised that a lot. Uh, have raised that a lot. Um, uh, what do you think of how this narrative is unfolding and, um, you know, and, and how the government is responding to these challenges on affordability? It really is about affordability. And, you know, Jack Layton used to talk a lot about the kitchen table. It's great to talk about cabinet ministers and cabinet gamesmanship. But when we talk about what's happening around kitchen tables, people are concerned. We're not into a state of lockdowns yet. We might get to, but we are getting back into some restrictions. Um, and, and part of the challenge with that becomes, Peter, that the, the new version of CERB doesn't uh, kick in if you're just in sort of restrictions. It doesn't kick in until you're lockdowns. Mm -hmm. There's some concerns around wage subsidies, concern around CERB. There's concern around the GIS uh, program. So how does that impact everyday Canadians as we're all trying to figure out not only how to get through Christmas, but how do we get through that beginning of January? And that's going to be an affordability that is squarely at the, that can be fixed by the government and certainly with a willing minority government partners. All right. Um, well, here we go. We've, we're almost through four weeks here of the, the new parliament. Uh, lots of cooperation on, on certainly the uh, key things the government wanted to move forward. Uh, not sure we're going to see that cooperation when they all come back uh, in, in the new year, uh, depending on where we are, I guess, with Omicron as well. But listen, good to talk to you all. Uh, have a, a great uh, holiday period, and uh, we'll talk again in the new year. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. And that's all the time we have for this edition of Primetime Politics. I'm Peter Van Dusen. From all of us here at CPAC, thanks for watching. Take care until next time.